Good morning once again, everyone, and welcome again into our house of worship today. As always, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be alive and active in this place, that above all, we will hear God speaking as we turn to the Scripture. And as many of you know, we've been spending a lot of time in the early days of Jesus' ministry the past few weeks this year. We've been following very closely with our church's lectionary selection of, of scriptures. And this is the Sunday before Lent begins, and traditionally in the church's calendar, this is known as Transfiguration Sunday. The story we often read on this weekend is a story of Jesus taking his disciples up onto the mountain. So we're reading that text today. We'll be finding it in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 43. And so the scriptures tell us, beginning in Luke 9, 28, that about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter and John and James with him and went up on to a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice, a voice from the cloud came, saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams and throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him, and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion, but Jesus rebuked the impure spirit. He healed the boy and gave him back to his father, and they were all amazed the greatness of God. Thanks be to God for these scriptures that have been given to us this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, as I've already mentioned, today is Transfiguration Sunday on the church's traditional calendar. Many other churches are also reading this story when Jesus revealed his divine face to his disciples on the mountaintop. Now perhaps the largest physical uh, symbol that we have in this text that fades into the background a little bit is probably this image of the mountain, the place where the disciples went up with Jesus in order to pray. I think that as we read about the mountain in this story where the text takes place, I think that image is meant to evoke many other scenes in our minds, scenes from the scriptures. The mountain has often been a very important place 
in the history of Israel throughout the Bible, a place where humans have come close to God in various ways. After all, God first made a covenant with Abraham on top of a mountain. Moses received the law and communed with God on behalf of the people on top of a mountain. Elijah called down fire from heaven on a mountain top. And of course, Jesus' most famous sermon is also known as the Sermon on the Mount. The setting of the mountain has traditionally been a place where humans have encountered God in very powerful ways. The mountain has also been a symbol to us very often in the church, a symbol that often describes for us those times in our lives when we have also come very close to God and had some kind of powerful experience. I don't know how many of you have heard that term before. Someone said I had a mountaintop experience. Something happened in my life where I felt so close to God. The presence of God seemed so real and clear to me. We may have had a moment like that where we felt the wonder of God perhaps during worship, perhaps in prayer or service, or maybe we witnessed some sort of natural wonder and suddenly felt as if God was so very real. I've had those moments myself during prayer, during worship, during mission, and also while it was outside in nature. You know, some of the moments that stick out the most to me while I was in the natural world, one of the ones that comes to mind is when I was out wandering in the early morning on a cold fall morning, out in the woods during a retreat. The air was very crisp and you could just feel the sounds of nature and it just felt like the spirit was alive there. We also had the opportunity to go down in 2017, down into southern Illinois, to see the eclipse that took place a couple years ago. I don't know how many of you have seen the, I don't know how many of you also went to go see the total eclipse of the sun, or have had any kind of experience like that. When you're going down to see the eclipse, it seems like, well, it's not going to be that exciting. I know what it's like during nighttime. I have an idea of what an eclipse is going to be like. But let me guarantee you, if you haven't seen it, you have no idea what an eclipse is like. The sudden, just there's a certain atmosphere in the air as the sun is covered up. There's a very eerie feeling. You can almost feel it in your skin. I'm not surprised that cultures throughout the world have, have interpreted that moment as a very spiritual place. And also one of the most common experiences that many of us have also probably had, that I know I have had, is whenever I've gone up perhaps to a cliff or to some very high place and looked out to the world below me. You know that sudden feeling when you see the entire vista laid out below you. Everything's so much smaller, you can see further away. It's like your perspective on the world suddenly shifts. You forgot what it looked like all the way up there. As I've already mentioned, I believe the mountaintop in Scripture is a place that symbolizes for us a place where people go to have their perspective changed on God or on the world. I also think the mountain symbolizes other things for us. For instance, I don't know how many of us are really big climbing enthusiasts. How many of us like to go out and climb cliffs for a hobby or just for fun? I'm sure there's people out there like that, but I'm also sure that for most of us, climbing a mountain doesn't sound like something that we would like to do. It sounds a little more difficult, time-consuming, strenuous, not very fun at all. I'm not really sure if the disciples wanted to climb a mountain with Jesus just to go pray for an afternoon, but of course they did it anyway. They climbed that mountain because Jesus was going in that direction and they wanted to follow him. Even if their journey got a little difficult, a little uncomfortable. Now like the disciples, I'm sure that many of us might also have mountain-like experiences that come into our lives. We might go through very difficult situations when it gets really hard to keep 
pressing forward, when we don't want to stay faithful, we don't want to keep climbing. Of course, the biblical example is that whenever the going gets rough in our lives, whenever the going gets rough for the disciples, those who keep following Jesus, who keep climbing the mountain, are going to see something wonderful. They're going to be changed. The disciples wouldn't have witnessed the face of God that afternoon if they hadn't followed Jesus up the mountain. But of course they did follow him there. And after taking that journey, after experiencing God in a new way, the question was put before them, what would they do next? Isn't that always the question whenever we have some sort of spiritual moment in our lives? What do we do after that? What are we supposed to do after having a mountaintop experience? <clears throat> Where do we go from there? Does it change anything about us at all? Like Peter, do we tell Jesus, Lord, why don't we build some shelters up here so we can stay a little longer? Why don't we stay in this far off place, away from the rest of the world, where God feels so much closer? But of course, my friends, we cannot stay on the mountain. That was never the intention of Jesus to keep his disciples up there. The goal of our faith is not to escape the world up on the mountaintop, but the goal of our faith is to come close to Christ so that we can go back down the mountain, back into the real world, into the valleys and the dark places. What was it like when those disciples came back down the mountain the next day? The very next day after having this divine experience, what was happening? I think it's interesting, the first thing they encounter is this large crowd gathered at the foot of the mountain waiting for Jesus. You know what the other Gospels tell us? They say that the crowd was busy arguing with the disciples who were left there. Luke doesn't tell us the crowd was arguing. But we do have this man who comes out of the crowd begging Jesus for some help. He tells him that his child is oppressed by a demon, that it is often thrown to the floor, that they suffer from seizures and other problems, that the, the boy is dying. He tells Jesus, I came to your other disciples in order to get some help, and they couldn't do anything. And even in the middle of this scene, the young boy begins shaking, having another seizure, falling on the ground. And strangely, Jesus turns to the crowd, and the first thing he does is rebuke them. He tells them, you perverse generation. How long must I stay with you? It always felt like a kind of surprising twist in that story. I wasn't sure what made Jesus so angry before he decides to help the boy to heal them. I've often wondered to myself what sparked his anger in that moment. What caused him to rebuke the crowds before healing the child? Well, you know what my theory is, is that when Jesus came back down that mountain and the first thing he sees is a man coming, begging him for help. He told him, I took my child to your disciples, and they couldn't do anything. I have this picture in my mind of the disciples laying their hands on the boy, saying a few prayers. No miracle happens, so they leave him alone. I wonder if the whole crowd had kind of backed off from this child because it wasn't their problem. Perhaps the first thing Jesus sees is a young child having a seizure on the ground, and nobody was doing anything. After all, if they couldn't heal the child through, through prayer, what else could they do? It's kind of an absurd question, actually, when you put it that way. I think that Jesus was angry with the crowd, and even his own disciples, because no one was willing to show compassion. No one was willing to show enough faith to keep caring for him, to keep helping him, even when there was no miracle happening. I think these two scenes are put next to each other very intentionally in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
These two scenes of the mountaintop experience, of the transfiguration, and then the crowds who were ignoring a child who was suffering. I think that as disciples, as we follow Jesus in this world, we are occasionally going to have these really significant spiritual moments where it's just you and God coming close together. But our job as disciples is not to stay in that moment. Our goal is not to seek out God in some abstract way. But the purpose of our faith is to march back down the mountain, to go out to find people who need our help, to find people whom others are ignoring, looking the other way, to find those and show them the same love that God has already shown to us. I think that both the high places and the low places in our lives are already filled with God's presence, but those who haven't climbed the mountain, who may not have seen his face, they need some help. And it is our job to show them the compassion of Christ. It is our job to share his presence with them. And you know what the scriptures even tell us that we'll see his face when we do that? Well, that's part of what it means to be a disciple, to show mercy, compassion, and justice to those who have been ignored. A faithful disciple is not only the one who follows Jesus through the hard times in their own life, who has those spiritual highs with God, but also the one who takes their faith and goes out and uses it to find others. And to help them. For those who have seen his face, that is the kind of disciple we need to become. You join me in prayer this morning. Once again, our Father, we come to you today looking for the light of your face to shine into our lives. And as we're filled with your light, O oh Christ, I pray that you will encourage us, that you will help us to show compassion towards others, to share grace with more people, to show them the light that you have given us to share. We pray this today in the name of Christ, our Savior. Ellen, would you mind shutting off the camera? I'll have to cut that part. <laughs> That's okay.